Welcome back to Oakhaven. We're working on a project this week that I'm pretty excited about. It's really nothing unusual, it's just honeysuckle removal. But it's honeysuckle removal on these slopes. These slopes are really difficult to work on. So we've kind of put off honeysuckle removal on these slopes for the, the end. We've done most of the flat areas. Now we've got these slopes to deal with. They're a pretty steep slope. I would say that um, you know a, a, a roofer would call these a 912 slope here. So there's for every 12 feet of, or 12 inches of run, there's nine inches of drop. So that's a little less than a 45 degree angle. It's a 36 degree angle, but still steep enough that you can't just walk up these slopes and cut things and treat them. So we're going to talk about our process for how we deal with these slopes. Uh, as you can tell, we use climbing gear. So we're up here on top of the slope. Normally when I work on a slope, if it's a slope I can walk on, I will tend to clear the bottom of the slope first and then walk into new areas so that I'm not dropping honeysuckle and other bushes into areas that I'm working. I'm always walking into a new area. This is not practical because it's hard to, to climb up the slope with all of our gear. It's much easier to repel down. So we're gonna start at the, the top of the slope and work our way down. Now that means that all of the brush that we're clearing is falling into the area that we're going to be clearing later on, which is a pain, I'll tell you. Um, I try to just like throw it over my shoulder and try to get it down as far as possible so we have a pile of brush down at the bottom and just work around it. I don't have a better solution to that. So that's what we're, that's what we're doing, starting up at the top. Up here on the top, we basically have two slopes. We've got one slope that's walkable and then it comes into this steeper slope that's harder to walk on. So what we're going to do is we're going to set an anchor up here where it's easy to work and then run it over the edge. I mean, theoretically, you could do a cliff like this, but we're doing a more of a slope. So it's the rope is, is helping us, is steadying us, but we're not necessarily hanging on it and floating around in the air. Uh, the rope that we're using, this is a climbing rope. Uh, we rock climb, so this is the kind of rope that we use in rock climbing. It's a pretty good quality rope. It's a dynamic rope. Uh, when you look at ropes, you see uh, basically two different types. There's dynamic ropes that have a little bit of stretch to them. They're meant for fa fall protection, so that if you're climbing up, if you're rock climbing and you fall, you come, to the end and you come to the end of the rope and it doesn't jolt you, it has some give to it. It's almost like a bungee cord. Not nearly as stretchy as a bungee cord, but has a little bit of give to it. For what we're doing here, it would probably be better to have a static rope. A static rope doesn't have any give to it. You use a static rope for, rope for um, hauling uh, gear around or for pulling a tree down, things where you don't want to have uh, stretch to the rope. What we have is a climbing rope, so that's what we're going to use. The fact that it's dynamic, it, it isn't really helping us in this situation, but it doesn't hurt us that, that much either. We have a rock climbing harness here, again, because that's what, what we have on hand. You can buy harnesses online. I can, I've seen them on Amazon. You can buy an inexpensive harness that would be fine for this. It may not quite have the padding that you would want to, to have for rock climbing where you'd have a fall, but uh, it, it's a basic harness and you can get one for like $20 on, on Amazon. Um, the idea is that it gives you some place to attach your rope to and it supports your body. You can also build that yourself out of, out of ropes. To me, for a $20 harness uh, on Amazon, I'm not gonna build a, rope, a harness out of rope. Okay, so finding an anchor point. We wanna find a place that we can hang off of this, this steep area, but it's still safe to work. Down here, if you look down here at the base of this shallow slope that I was talking about, there's a nice big tree that we could tie onto, but it would be really hard to get it set up because it's right on the edge of the slope. So if you come up this more natural slope, there's a couple of good sized trees further up the slope that we're going to use as our anchors. Now, when you're anchoring to a tree, obviously you don't want to anchor to a tree that's too small, that's just going to be flimsy and fall over or something that's not very well, how do you choose the best anchor? Uh, rock climbers tend to uh, say you, you want to choose something that's five inches or, or bigger in diameter. That's probably overkill for what we're talking about doing, but you know, look around and see what's available. We're in a woods, there's lots of trees, there's lots of opportunities to, to tie onto things. Often rock climbers or uh, people that are traversing along a, a route and using rappelling will want to rappel down to the bottom and then they'll want to get their gear back. They want to get their rope back. 
So they will just loop the rope around the tree and rappel down both ends of the rope, either loop it around the tree or work out some sort of a harness up here and then come down so that they have both ends of the rope down to the bottom. Then they can pull on one end of the rope, pull it back up around the tree and then they can get their rope back and they can continue on or do whatever it is that they want to do. I'm not concerned about that as far as I'm concerned. I don't mind putting a, a solid anchor up here. I'm going to go down one strand of rope just because when I started this off I was using two strands of rope because that's what I think of when doing rock climbing. Uh, two strands of rope just meant twice as much rope to get confused with and get tangled up in. So one strand works better for me. So when we're rock climbing, it's super important for us to make sure that we keep our rope clean. You're working on rocks, you've got sandstone and sand and dirt around. You don't want to get that into the rope where it's, it's got particles in there that are wearing on your rope. You want to keep it clean. Generally, we would put down a tarp, keep the rope on the tarp, and then it's just free hanging up the, the rock face. So it's basically staying clean here, there. This is a completely different situation because we are going to tie the rope off on the ground. It's going to be running across the ground. And we're going to be using it on the ground the whole time. So the rope will get dirty. Um, we will wash it when we're done with this project. Because our rope is a lot longer than it needs to be, I'm going to tie it off, but leave probably half the rope sitting here. So I'm going to find a good length of rope that I know goes all the way down to the bottom. So I know from experience working on this yesterday that this, which is my halfway point in the rope, is about what I need to get down to the bottom. So I'm going to make sure I've got plenty more. And I'm going to start at this point. So I'm going to wrap this around the tree. And I want to make this secure, so I'm going to take a, a bite of this rope a little loop of this rope, and I'm going to just put a half hitch in there. Okay, and then I'm going to take a carabiner. We've talked about carabiners before, because I'll use one to hold my gear, and I'll use one to hold the the um, herbicide tank. And those types of carabiners, I buy cheap. I buy them two for a dollar at the dollar store. They're made out of really lightweight aluminum. They're uh, the gates are really flimsy. I don't want to use a cheap <laughs> carabiner in this situation because I'm going to be hanging off of it. So this is actually a climbing carabiner. It's a much heavier duty. So I'm going to clip that on there. I'm going to clip it around the area that's going down to the bottom of the slope. I'm going to work this down to the bottom of the tree because that's where it's going to be strongest. Tighten it up so it's not moving around. So that's going to be my anchor point. Now, if we look down the slope, we'll see there's a ton of little trees and other things before we get to the slope. So I'm going to choose my route. I've already done from here to the right. So I'm going to go kind of over where the saw and the herbicide is to where that big tree is that I said I wasn't going to tie up on. I'm going to choose a route that brings the rest of this rope down that direction. Okay, I have the rope anchored farther up above. It's on a good solid anchor. I'm on a place where it's fairly level. I'm, I don't feel insecure being on this slope. Uh, there's a little path here that, that uh, I can stand on. If I were to just run down the rope or the, uh, the slope like this, I would need to be holding on with both hands. I need to be able to free up my hands to be working. So that's where the rock climbing comes in. On the harness, I'm gonna show two different ways of doing this. Our goal is to provide some sort of friction on this rope that holds us to keeps us from sliding down. So generally what we would do is use a figure eight. This is a friction device. I take a bite of rope, I slide it through the big part of the eight and then down around the small part. Okay, so now you can imagine that that's gonna provide all this friction as it rubs against the figure eight coming down. Then I can hook that onto my belt 
and lower myself down pretty easily. Okay? The problem is, if I let go, it just lets me slide down the hill. So I need to find a way that will hold me while I'm working because I need to, be ha I need to have my hands free to have the saw, to have the herbicide. That solution for rock climbers is with a Prusik or Prusik, depending on who you talk to. <laughs> Uh, it depends on where you learned. Uh, some people say Prusik, some people say Prusik, and whoever, however people say it, they're sure that they're right. So um, I'm going to say Prusik because it's what I'm used to. It come, flows off my tongue. To be honest, I think the right answer is probably Prusik. I think the guy's name that uh, invented it was more likely to be Prusik. Bear with me, and I'm going to call it Prusik. A Prusik is a circle of rope tied off or sewn off, depending on how you do it. You can buy them that are, are sewn together, pre-made, this one, I think, was, was bought pre-made, but it's just two knots. It's two fisherman knots tied on the ends that draw together, and it's tight. You can look up online how to, how to tie a Prusik, or you can buy a Prusik. Uh, that's kind of beyond the scope of what we're talking about here. But so the Prusik is going to add onto here. So in my situation, I want to add this Prusik. I'm going to lengthen this figure eight out away from me a little bit by putting in this quick draw. Okay, which is just a carabiner with a, a piece of fabric between it that we use for sport climbing. That gives me more room. And I'm going to, to tie a prusik onto this rope that's going down to the bottom of the hill. It's going to form my hand. It's going to be, take the place of my hand when my hand is not holding onto this rope. So I take the loop, wrap it around the, the loose end of the, the climbing rope, and I wrap it around. And I do that like three times. I'm actually gonna do it more than three times. Okay, so you can see how that looks now. We've got all these ropes wrapped around and they're gripping like a boa constrictor, gripping that rope then I can clip that onto my belt and when I lean back that holds the rope so I can pull it and it loosens up so I'm, I'm reconfiguring this, I put another loop in the Prusik uh, because it was getting up too far. It was getting actually running into the, the, the figure eight. So here I'm going to reattach this. Pull that up. So now it's a little farther away. So there's a little bit of a gap there. So now when I lean back, I don't need to be holding onto this tail because the Prusik is doing that. If I want to go down, I can just pull that Prusik, loosen it up, and it allows me, it allows the rope to slide through the figure eight. If I let go, the Prusik tightens up. As soon as it's taut here, the Prusik constricts, and it holds me up. I can just lay like this forever. Now, I recognize that some people will do this proje project without the figure eight, because you can do it with just the Prusik. I could have the Prusik attached here, and just pull it down and it would grab the rope if I let go and I would pull it down and grab the rope when I let go. I actually did that yesterday because a number of people have said to me that ah, oh, this is redundant to have the figure eight and the Prusik. By the time I'd worked with it for a while and the, the Prusik had gotten so tight uh, that it was, it was difficult to slide. In this situation, the Prusik isn't taking my weight. The figure eight is taking my weight. So I'm not tightening that up really tight by uh, my weight on there. It, it's just a loose, it's just a little bit of tension from this tail end. So it stays loose the whole time. Just easier for me because I already have the figure eight. I have the Prusik, it works out great. If you don't have a figure eight and you don't want to buy one, I think it's $10, you can do this with just the Prusik. Uh, it, it's, it gets tight at the end. You, as, you take some slack off of it and you loosen it up a little bit and you start over again. That's up to you. There's a lot of different ways to do this, and I'm sure the comments will be filled with 
lots of comments about, oh, you should do it this way, you should do it that way. Great, I'd love to hear other alternatives. So now we're all roped in. Now the equipment that we're gonna bring down with us on the slope. This is our herbicide sprayer. Uh, we've talked about it a lot, so uh, we've got a whole video on how we make it. Um, we just have a, a shoulder strap on a spray bottle. We've modified the end of it so it doesn't spray. It saturates a sponge onto some nylon so we can paint it on. We always have it saturated and ready to go. That can go over my shoulder. I've got a carabiner, one of those cheap carabiners that I buy at the dollar store on the back that I can hook onto my back belt loop. That allows me to work around and it becomes kind of like a fanny pack. The, the bottle is out of the way and I can be working without that falling in front of me. So again, check out our video if that's interesting to you. Let me just mention the herbicide. So I know a lot of people don't like to use herbicide. They would say, ah, oh, you, sh you should just dig it out and weed rather than using the herbicide. On a slope like this, if I were just to grub out the, um, well, first of all, if I were just to cut it and let it re-sprout, which you do on the level ground, people do that on the level ground all the time, and they say, oh, I'll just go back and I'll recut it and I'll recut it and I'll recut it until I, I starve the, the roots. That works. I don't want to be doing this whole rappelling down the hillside five or six times until I've depleted the, the uh, food stores and the roots of these things. It's important to me, I want to kill it, get it done, and be, move on to the next area. So I will use herbicide. So that's where I cut it and I treat it. People say, oh, well, you, can, you could grub it out of the ground. You could just uh, weed it out. Well, on a slope, anytime you pull something out of the ground, you're disturbing the soil. Next time it rains, that soil is going to wash down. You, you don't want to disturb the, uh, the slope any more than you have to. Ideally, what we'd like to do is cut off the, the um, shrubs, leave the roots in place there to hold the soil, open it up so that it gets more sun in here. You, have the, uh, you don't have the, uh, the chemicals that are released by the honeysuckle that are inhibiting the, the growth of the native uh, plants. Um, so once you get that cleared up, then you, you have an herbaceous layer that grows in and that holds the soil better. Uh, by leaving the roots in place, it gives you a few years of those roots holding the soil in place uh, before something else comes in and, uh, and takes over that job. We also are bringing down a chainsaw. This is the 20 volt, 12-inch uh, DeWalt electric chainsaw. Generally what we do when we're, we're cutting honeysuckle, we use our, our bigger chainsaw. We've got a 16-inch, 60-volt uh, DeWalt, which has more power. I, I prefer to cut with it. Uh, it's just a lot to hug up, uh, bring up and down the slope. Plus, I've got a uh, carabiner and a short length of uh, rope on it. I can hang this as I'm working, and it's off the ground. The 16-inch bar is actually in the ground, which is always bad for a, a chainsaw. So that's basically our equipment. We're going to head down. So when I started doing this, I felt like my, my tail rope needed to be down behind me, so I would throw it down the slope as far as I could, and it would get tangled up into things. That was a pain. Now, with the single rope, I found that it's easier to just have it up here on the slope and I bring it down with me as I go. Whenever rappelling, it's always a good idea to put some sort of a rope or some sort of a knot in the end of the rope so that when you get to the end, it will stop you so you won't rappel off the end of the rope. I guess that's a serious danger that people, if your rope is uh, short, it's before the end of the, the um, slope, you come and you rappel right off and that's not a pretty sight. So we are all set with that. We're going to work our way down. So as we're filming this, uh, you see that Kimber is with us running around. Uh, whenever we're working and we're using herbicides, we would rather not have her get into it, uh, so we put her away before we continue working. As I'm working down the slope, basically the tool that I have is this chainsaw. Normally, if we're on a flat area, I would go through 
and cut out small stuff like this little multiflora rose with a brush cutter, which cuts much better on that small things. It, it's, it slices through quickly and it leaves a nice smooth surface to, uh, to put herbicide on. I can't use a brush cutter on the slope, so basically the only tool that I have to work with is the uh, chainsaw. And if I cut with a chainsaw, be careful of ropes. <laughs> Don't want to cut the rope. Be very cautious of where the rope is. If I try to cut something small like that with a chainsaw, I don't know if you can see it, it throws it all around. It doesn't cut very smoothly. If I'm trying to cut something bigger, it grabs on. But because the, the, the small little sapling or the, the um, multiflora rose in this case is so small, it just gets thrown around by the blade. I call that the, uh, the, the Superman in a paper bag principle. Th there's plenty of power in the saw but the plant moves around too much for it to grab onto. It's like when you, if you wanted to capture Superman and you put him into a big, a big paper bag, he couldn't get out because the paper bag will just give any way he goes. He punches over here and the paper bag just gives and you could trap Superman. I don't know where I got that from. Probably shouldn't even be mentioning it, but there we go. <laughs> so the, to solve the, the Superman in a, in a paper bag principle, I did bring one other tool in my back pocket, which is just a, a small little cutter, small little pruner, that probably works better, it cuts better, these small things, rather than just tearing apart um, the small saplings and the multiflora rows. I go back and forth between whether I cut that with a, a pruner or whether I just hit it with the chainsaw. Uh, you know, when you, when all you've got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When you're hanging up the side of a mountain and you've got a chainsaw in your hand, it seems like that's the most appropriate thing to do, so I tend to use it more than I probably should. The nature of working off of a rope is that I can't just wander around wherever I want. I'm pretty much limited to work within an arc. So in this situation, I will work my way over as far as I can this way. And once I've done everything on this side, then I'll swing over to that side and basically get everything that's that same distance down. Then I'll lower myself down, swing back, and just work my way in arcs down the slope. Now as I'm working down the slope, I've done everything off to my left, so I can take little things that I think are going to get in my way and just toss them off to the, the left, and that's a useful thing. Okay, here's an autumn olive. I'm not trying to make any effort to drag these off site and clear things up. Okay, I can hang my wand over there. And slide down to the next level. That's what we're doing uh, these days, working the slopes. I feel really good about it. We've come a long way along this slope. This process is working pretty well. Hopefully this is useful to you. Uh, those of you that have hill, rolling hillsides, maybe you've wondered how to, how to handle the ropes or how to handle the, uh, the slopes, and hopefully this is useful. Uh, if it is, hit the like button. Even if it's not useful, but uh, you found it uh, entertaining, go ahead and hit the like button. We always appreciate new subscribers, people that are interested in learning uh, techniques for maintaining their woodlands. So thanks for coming along.